I was told so many stories And I kept them in my stomach Lies the truth, fake smiles of blood money I lost calls at a loss for words Trying to keep my tone down when I'm saying concern Unusual, context unique Buried in the depths of metaphorical speech A hidden message Pull the infinite strings Reconnect the ends and pretend to justify the means Parallel, we're reading the same page Turn days in the literature Simple as loose change, it was perfect Or at least that's what I'm told Courage is dead, spending my life Fearing the cold, I was useless Feeling like dead weight, plain as day And a deuce in my hand shakes Originality was spread across the board Intricate self-worth, I'm searching for more There we are, more plates. Thanks for that guys. As you can see, we're not just getting plates from America and Canada and Australia and New Zealand and uh, South Africa. We're also getting quite a lot from Europe. Now we've got France, Spain, Portugal represented, Germany, obviously lots from Germany, but look, East European plates. Now who can tell us where this one comes from? Who can tell us where that's from in the comments? Answers for 10. <laughs> There's no prizes, Tom. No prizes for that one. <laughs> Right, okay, you know what this is, don't you? Um, Wimoto Parts. The other day we went to the Wimoto company and we bought all the bits for the Street Fighter and at that time, a certain person not too far from here decided she'd like some bits for her Triumph and it is really due a bit of a makeover. Had the Triumph now for four years, there's nothing wrong with it, it's absolutely beautiful. We did the custom work on it, what, over the first two, three years, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. We did loads and loads of videos on it. If you look in the Triumph Scrambler videos playlist, there's just loads of stuff. We slammed it on the big fat wide road tires and as it's gone on, we just want to kind of upgrade things as we go. We've got tech exhaust, which looks fantastic. It gives it a whole new look to a scrambler, which is high level pipes. But I think it's time to just go a little bit further and do something a little bit more fun. So the first thing that we decided we'd do is a chain of sprockets. When I bought this bike in 2013, one of the things that niggled me straight away was the chain of sprockets because I felt that for a bike that was all black with gold writing on it that this dull as pig water grey chain was just miserable honestly and once it gets chain lube on it it looks even more miserable but it was a utility bike for quite some time I didn't really want it to look nice I just used it for work and once Penny's got it it's become a bit more of a princess now hasn't it? It has. It's a little punished princess pony mm -hmm. and that means we're going to do some visual stuff to it to this year we've got some brakes coming up and so on but at the moment we're going to put a gold chain because i showed you the other day this rather amazing did gold chain i absolutely love these i'm going to put one on the street fighter that's what we got it from it's exactly the same specification slightly different length but it's exactly the same spec as the one for the street fighter it's a 525 did gold chain we put that on also we're going to upgrade the sprockets as well uh, well so i thought i was um, because obviously the, the sprocket on the back of the Kawasaki was a bit of a mess and it's pretty much worn out. Um, what I decided to do instead was upgrade to a Sun Star sprocket. That's the black one that's got the twisted sort of look in it and pretty cool. That's better. And so I set off and I thought I'll get a Sun Star sprocket for this, which would be black, but they don't make them in black, they come different colours. So what we've got in the end for the Scrambler is a silver Sunstar sprocket to go with the gold chain. That's not the end of the world because there's a lot of silver on the bike. Um, the shocks are silver, the exhaust, obviously the brake disc, the other side. So we're going to pop a silver Sunstar sprocket on there, which I think is rather amazing. And interestingly enough, it's already got one. Did you know that, Penny? No. When we look closely at the bike, the existing sprocket that comes from the factory is a Sunstar sprocket, it's got a Sunstar stamp on it. So it goes to show that choosing a Sunstar sprocket means you're picking factory standard parts. And is there a better way to do it? I don't think so. So we've got that, we've got a JT sprocket for the front. JT sprockets, now, if you don't know about these, you should do, honestly. Even the packets are to get open. <laughs> it's that super non-bustable plastic, but I think it yields the scissors in the end. There we go. A Sunstar sprocket on there and a JT on the front. You've all seen these. They are just about the best sprockets money can buy for the front. Now I've done videos in the past, as you know, where I've 
change the front sprocket prematurely before the rear. I do, in the past, I've done three front sprockets to one rear because they turn three times more often because they are a third of the size. It ain't hard, is it? Not really. It really ain't hard. But there is no need anymore. That has been dealt with by the likes of JT sprockets because they're so hard and they're so durable and tough that they just don't wear like they used to. So you don't have to do that any longer. You can put chain sprocket set on it and when it shows itself to be worn out, and I'll show you how that works at the end, then you change the whole darn lot. It's as simple as that. A lot easier, a lot less, a lot less fuss and it's a nicer way to do it. So I'm going to put those on and this rather amazing chain. You just want to see this, don't you? Mm. So have a look. Let's do the unboxing. Penny fixed up. Come out, it's a green one. <laughs> there we go, look at that. How beautiful is that? You got the shoes in there? Yeah, look at that, there we are. DID gold chain, 525 heavy duty X ring chain. I don't honestly think it gets any better than that. That's the kind of chain that you would put on a Hayabusa, an R1, any sports bike you care to name with any amount of brake horsepower that you care to name. You could put that on a 250 horsepower bike and it would have no issues at all. It's going on one with about 57 horsepower. So it's just a, it's a thing of beauty and it will be buffed up and kept nice and shiny and we'll use a, a dry lube on it, a Worth Dry Lube, which is a really good product that doesn't build, doesn't get sticky and oily, but it does lube the channel. I'll come to that at the end. Right, we'll put that back in the packet because we don't need that at the moment. Wrap it all up and let's make a start stripping off the factory stuff. Okay, look, this little puddle of tools here, that lot, and a couple of bits of stuff is all you need. It's not, it's not a big, involved, scary job. Changing the chain of sprockets is something that does still strike fear into the hearts of many people as novice mechanics, the same as wood, fork seals, headstock bearings, swing arm bushes, all that stuff. We're going to try and cover it so make it really easy. Demystify the BS and make it as simple as it is. First job with this, that's it look, that is it. I've got a big old socket, um, a big span, a few sockets, bits and pieces. There's nothing much, you don't need a big toolkit. First thing you need for the particular bike here has got Torx bolts that hold the chain guard on so dealing with that I've got these funky little wee hole ones you know I bought that stuff recently and you just take your chain guard off first get that out of the way job done simples there we are off the next thing is let's get to the front sprocket itself You'll have a various different method of getting to your front sprocket on your bike. I'll leave that one in until last. You might have to take foot pegs out of the way, bits of body work out of the way, whatever, and I'm sure you can deal with that. If you deal with your bike in the correct way, a little bit of copper slip on the business end of each bolt is always a good sign. Again, putting bike bolts back where they come from, what about that? Here's an option, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Not going to lose them, are you? Job done, we'll put that over there too. Okay, next thing, we're in at this now. I'm going to loosen this off before we go any further. Before we take the wheel out, loosen the back wheel, do anything, I'm going to back off this because that needs to be held. This sprocket needs to be held, money fingers. <laughs> this sprocket needs to be held still in order to get that undone, and that is a task. There's several methods, I've covered them in the past. Let's see if we can do it just by using the brake pedal, which is often the easiest way. On top of this sprocket, it's got a tab washer that's been bent over. So you get a big soft metal plate washer and the factory just fits the sprocket. They fit the nut. So this is factory torque, so that's going to be tight. And then they tab this little washer over and that piece of metal bent over just leans against there and it stops it undoing itself. Quite simple. So to get that undone, you just need a little chisel like that. Come in from the side, a few taps. You don't need to hit it that hard. You should never hit anything that hard unless you really need to. And try not to mince this washer because ultimately what you'd like to do is tab that back over afterwards and use it again. Saves you having to replace it. There you go. Panel beating skills, how's that? 
Right, it's getting that undone. And this is a moment of truth for any of us. If you've done this job yourself, you'll know this is a point in the in the build where you get a moment of dread, and when it happens or it goes right, you get that moment of relief. So I don't know where this is going to be. This is factory fitted. This bike's never had a change sprockets. That was talked up probably with a windy gun by the factory four years ago. So who knows? But the first way of making the the chain stays still because the chain will hold that still that spins because that's a gearbox sprocket that goes into the transmission and through the motor and that has nothing holding it still you can even turn it with your fingers carefully simple as that so if you want to get that off normally the first thing to try is just lean on the brake pedal if you lean on the brake pedal you're holding the back wheel still the back wheel being held still holds the chain still holds that still that should work most of the time it does if it doesn't don't lean on it too hard. If you've got someone standing on the brake and you've got a nine foot bar with two friends hanging off the end of it, that's too much for the brakes. You're gonna do damage to the bike. You're gonna possibly break the cush drives. You're gonna break the little veins in the cush drive. Then you need to resort to the chain method I did in a previous video where you take the back wheel out and you pin the chain around the axle. That's far more solid. But for now, let's see if it goes this way. This is honestly live as it happens. <laughs> as it happens. Right. Some movement. There. Just lean on the brake pedal and lean on that. Oh, that went nicely. But as you saw, it does go suddenly. Bang! It's free. There's no kind of force to getting it off. It just pop. It just goes. Simple as that. So there we are. We were very lucky on that. Did with the brakes. Okay, now in the past when I've done chain videos, I've always took a disc like that and just locked it straight through the chain. Uh, in the past before that, before I had a disc grinder, I just put a hacksaw through it, simple as that. But it's not always a great way to do because this chain is actually only 5,000 miles old and I'm going to keep it because long term down the road, that will be a perfectly serviceable chain. It will get stored really oily in a sealed Tupperware box with a little bit of oil and sawdust in and it will stay there forever until one day that I need it. Simple as out some chain loom or something. And the same with the sprockets because there's hardly anywhere on the motor or any change in them for a little upgrade so that the sprockets are a bit fancy and you've got a nice gold chain. That's really it. So I'm going to take this out with a chain splitter. Now I've never shown one of these. I've never done one of these on a video. Um, what I wanted to do was to, to show it properly. Now in the videos that we did for uh, the Fork seals, the first fork seal video, I showed you how to drive in a fork bush and a fork seal using two lengths of white plastic waste pipe. And that's a great hack, it always works. But on the second video, as you saw, I used a proper chain, uh, a proper seal driving tool, which I bought instead because we're being supported by the patrons. I want to upgrade the garage a little bit and show you there is a proper way to do it as well. Because these tools are coming down in price, they really are, they're not as expensive as they used to be. And more and more of you are doing more and more stuff. So. I think it's a wise thing to do today to show you how we're going to use a chain breaker and riveter. So it's as simple as that. And what I've done is I've got a Sealy one. I'm not particularly endorsing this one. There's loads of them on the market. Uh, this is a Sealy chain breaker. You've seen these. You can get them on eBay. You can get them from anywhere. We found, I looked on, the reason I got this one, quite simply, was I looked on Sealy. I like Sealy tools. I've had them for years. I've got loads of Sealy stuff. And I looked on the website and this, this particular item is something like 72 pounds on the Sealy website. But when you go on Wimoto, where I got all this stuff from, I was scrolling down, and I was only motivated to buy this because it isn't 70 quid on the Wimoto website. It's actually only 35 quid, 36 pounds. So I think it's nearly half price if you buy it from Wimoto. So when we bought all the parts, the chains, all that, I just, you know, it's like, like I did with the stuff of the Kawasaki. I just chucked a chain breaker in. So I'm doing this as well to show you how to use one of these. So have a little look. This is the tool. Um, <coughs> It's basically a little, a little press and it allows you to fit these mandrels and these little pins and you can, these rivets here on the chain, it allows you to press that pin out nice and safely and then when you come to put the new link in, it gives you a method of, of spreading that link in a safe and scientific way because in the past, again, in the past when I did the last chain video on the Rat Bike Bandit, I used a centre punch a hammerhead and a hammer and that's the old hack method I've used right since the days 
of planishing the motor or mushrooming them. Years ago, when you had the little rivet link, you put it through, the two ends stuck out, and you just planished it over with a ball peen hammer. You turned it over to a little mushroom, so it stayed on. Well, they're long gone, you don't get those anymore. You now get a far more scientific method. I'm gonna show you that today. First of all, we're gonna split the chain. I'm gonna just press one of these tiny pins, not both of them, you need to do one, because when as soon as you push one of those pins out, the chain falls in half. I'm going to show you how to do that simple. First of all, is to have a close look at this tool. There's about six or seven things here you don't need for this job. This particular tool is not just for motorcycle chains, it's also for cam chains, which are tiny, tiny, tiny. I think it goes from, what size is it? Let's have a look. This chain is a 525, so it goes up to 630, which is a monstrous chain, right down to 35. I mean, a size 35 chain, that is absolutely minuscule. That's a chain for a, I don't know, like a little, a little cam chain in a tiny engine or something. So I'm gonna show you how to use this. First of all though, just to make it a little bit simpler, I'm gonna delete the things you don't need. I'm not gonna use that for a motorcycle chain. We're not gonna use that, or that, or that, or that. There we are. Now these items here, don't worry about them, they are for other chains and other applications, they're not for a motorcycle chain, you don't need to worry about those. These are the only tools you need. I'll show you the first thing we have. This is the press itself. It's got like a little inner piece there. We'll show this in two stages. First, how to split the chain. Now you've got that. You have a very strong purchase on it. That is cast steel, very strong. It comes with a little handle that screws in the bottom so you can hold it when you're doing the job and this thing here is nothing more than a t-bar to turn that when the time comes so let's have a look at these things here uh, you've got that and that item are to do with fitting the chain and so is that so for splitting the chain in half all we need is these parts here these are the parts we need now the size of the chain itself these are three sizes you got 2.2, uh, 2.9, and 3.8. It's 3.8 that you need for a motorcycle chain. That's the size of the pin that goes through the motorcycle chain. So we pop the little spring on there, wind it down to the end. Put that inside the magazine, and then put the back in. And that will come out now. As you push through, you can see that coming out. So let's pop it into the actual tool itself. This little pin needs to be back out of the way. So you back it out so it's actually down inside and that gives a dint there. There's a, there's a hollow in that now. And that hollow will pick up and centralize on the chain. Now, at this point, you can start winding on that and that pin that protrudes out the end will push the pin out, but and here's the biggest issue. I'll show you something on a drawing. These things are very easy to break if you lean on them too hard. You can spend, I'll sort of cover this bit, you can spend a thousand pounds on a chain breaker and it will then break just about any chain in the world. You could spend four or five hundred pounds on something like a snap on one and again it will probably break any chain that you come up to. But these things, these 70 odd pounds or 35 as we pay for it, these are DIY home ones and they're, they're reasonably easy to break if you use them in the way that was once directed. I'll show you what I mean. Take a look at this. Right, there's your chain. Like that. There's your two rollers inside the chain. And you've got a pin going through there. Like that. And you've got a big mushroom on the end as that pin comes through there. So the chain breaker it fits on this end and this end and this pin comes through and it pushes on there and it pushes that pin out that's its job but what it's trying to do is this mushroomed over steel here and here it's looking to shear that off it's got to literally tear that off the pin it's got to push that pin through that hole using the metal link itself as a shear and it's got to get all this metal and it's got to rip it off and that's quite a lot of force and what happens is this little pin inside here it snaps off or worse still it turns into that shape because this isn't man enough for the pin remember these pins 
in these chains. They are just probably the hardest metal in your motorcycle. Take a file and try and file one of the end of them pins. You won't even make a mark on it. They're just rock hard, tall steel. You won't move them. So trying to push them out with that little pin, you're going to break it. So to preserve your tool, to use some common sense, grind the head of the pin off. All I'm suggesting is you take your grinder and you grind that head off so it's completely flush with the link. And when you've done that, there's no mushroom left. And all you're pushing out is the internals of the pin, which is 10 times easier. I'll show you what I mean. There we go. So what I've done is taken that pin and just ground it off so it's completely flush. There's no mushroom, nothing's holding that pin in other than the resistance or the friction inside there. So let's get the tool set up and push that pin straight out. Now this receiving tool, this hole here, will go over the, the back of the pin, which you can feel. Like that. So you can locate it quite centrally on there. But this protruding pin needs to be inside even though we've ground the head off that needs to be inside the hole recessed down out of the way like a little mole in its hole just before you start and we locate that on the back of the chain and then just pinch this in like that it doesn't even need any more than your finger tight just finger tight that up that's all I do hold this still and then this pin find it now you can normally take the little T-bar, press it through and start turning and you'll feel it yield straight away. It's not hard, there you go. If it gets really, really stiff, really hard, stop because what you may have done is missed the pin and gone and be pushing against the plate. Don't stress the tool. There we go. And we just taking that super fine thread on here and I've got my finger on the back of this hole feeling for the pin which will produce itself or reveal itself in a minute and it's a nice smooth and even resistance it's not getting any stiffer or any lighter it's just pushing it out there it goes and all of a sudden it will go light there it is, and there is the chain pin that we've just ground the head off and pushed out. So let's literally push that pin straight out, that down there, and then back out, back the spike out because obviously that's that's through the chain, and then back that off completely. There it is, take it away, job done. And that will now just come apart like that. Spec that right out, drop out the drive pin, check the end of it, no burrs, no nothing, lovely, nice and healthy. If you grind that head off, that will push that out beautifully just by using that. If you have to start putting these on the end of that to push, then that's pushing too hard. No pin in any chain will ever be so hard that that T-bar won't get it out. If it is, then you haven't ground the head off properly. All right, and that's just common sense, taking care of your tools that you've paid for. I'm gonna pop that back in so I know where it is. And I'm gonna leave that there. Because in a minute, when we come to put the chain back on, we're gonna use that again. All right, front sprocket, because we already got that off. And that out of the way. Now the washer that's in here is orientated on teeth like that. Let me ask Rocket. Now when you get one of these, you know, have a little look. Um, that's a standard Triumph chain. They come with this molded rubber damper on it and that literally is to prevent rattle and to damp it a little bit to make it a bit heavier. And when you feel them, that is significantly heavier than the JT one, which means the rotating mass, rotating mass, reciprocating mass, where is it? I remember, the mm -hmm. going round mass is less so the engine doesn't have to work so hard to turn the bits and pieces. So a heavy sprocket, I mean, that's nearly double the weight, that factory one, but it's perfectly good so it will carry on in the future. All right, 18 tooth sprocket, sticking with the factory gearing. Don't see any reason to change it, do we, Pen? No. Nope. Happy with it as it is. Put my sprocket back on. Turn it around on there. Now, this, as you can see, these teeth or these 
splines are sticking out slightly but the nut itself has got a recess on the back into which they will fit and then that snucks up against the washer so it's definitely that way around not that way job done that's it bit common sense to hold that still all i'm doing is putting that chain just like that just from there to there a little bit more symbol so all i'm doing is i'm linking the back wheel to the front we found that originally the factory tension on that nut was all there was and that was fine for the brakes so because i haven't done anything to the back wheel i've just loosened it off all i'm going to do now is just do that back up using the brakes again so just using the chain to hold that still There we go. Right. That's it. When you take your wheel out, have a look in here, Ben. Mm -hmm. Can you see that down there? You see that little thing turning? Yep on its own, that's a spacer. So look out for your spacers because they're gonna drop out at some point. Right, axle out now. The spacers themselves, they'll... There we go, right. It's a spacer there, get rid of that. So wheel nut, wheel nut washer, Spacer, that's the next thing in the train. On the other side, here there's a spacer as well. I'll put it down the way it's orientated, that way. So you know it's orientated that way on. And that wheel now we can put on the bench. Right, before you do anything else, before you get involved in the cush drives and the sprocket and doing that, put your axle back through. This is one of the most common ways to forget how it all goes together. Put your axle back in, caliper mount back on, and that spacer which went on that way because the greasy side's in, and that caliper, that, that spacer there, through. Just, honestly, just dress it back up in order so that every fastener and spacer is where it's meant to be. Right, let's get the sprocket changed. Here's an interesting point I said earlier. Sun style sprocket. Exactly the same as the one we're putting on. Well, it's the same brand. Um, just a much nicer one. And I guess it goes to show if the factory choose a product, then it must be pretty good, mustn't it? Why don't you come and hold That's better. That look nice up here. Oh, much prettier. It's nicer looking, it. Master of the sun. Master of the sun.
the most important part really, getting this pressure link or compression link fitted in a proper manner. This is what you get in with the kit and it's a little bit different to the ones that used to get years ago. There used to be some that you had a little clip that went on and others you mushroom the ends over. And these are nothing like that. They're a precision thing and they need fitting in a proper way. So I'll show you how to do it using the tool that we showed you earlier, which we split the chain with. Right, chain's on, absolutely looks fantastic. Wiped off the worst of the white grease off the outside of the plates, but on the contrary, internally inside this link, you need loads and loads of it. They supply you a little sachet. So open that up. It's quite nicely made, so it just comes out the tip. And we need to put little O-rings on as well. So you should get four, there we go. And to be exact, they're not O-rings, they're X-rings actually. <laughs> Just to be pedantic. So don't be shy with this stuff, get loads of it on there, all around the base. And then bury these, your first two O-rings in there. Get them greased over the top as well. The more you put on the better. Like I said, don't be shy, put lots on, because it will never get inside this again once it's done up. Mount the chain on the sprocket and you want it at about sort of 10 o'clock or three o'clock, whichever side it is, and it's holding both halves then. And then pop that through from the inside. There we are. More white grease. Again, you can wipe off any excess, don't be shy with it. And two more of the X-rings over the top. Right, and then on top of those, some more grease. It helps to stick them in place anyway, you won't lose one and won't fall off. Now pop the outer plate on. Most of them will have something written on the outside. This one's got Japan, so make sure it's, for the sake of OCD, make sure it's not upside down. Doesn't matter, but you know, make sure you take the trouble to look. And then put it over the two pins and just press it on until it stops. You will not press that on with your fingers, not unless you are Steve Austin. <laughs> and I mean the bionic man, not that wrestling geezer who works in the desert now. There we go. Just hold it there and the grease will hold it as well. Now we need to set up the tool. Right, back to our chain tool. Now this is where the chain splitter becomes a chain riveter. So we're gonna take the actual press itself again, lift the back out again. We're gonna put a different pin in. Right, now we're gonna use the handle for the back. We don't need any pins for this one. What we need instead is these two plates. These two plates are effectively the anvils that will press that on. So we fit the first one in the back of the press. You wind that right out and fit the other one in the front, as simple as that. Now, the one with the ridge along it goes on the back because that's going on the back of the chain and it's gonna cover this ridge Come on over, Ben. Mm -hmm. This ridge simply covers the two rivets that are on the back and then allows it to press on the plate only. So that's what that ridge is for. And on this one, you've got two holes in it. And the idea of that is that when that presses on the front, it allows the pins to come through the holes and it allows the plate to be pressed over the top of them. So that's the way around it goes. It's the ridge at the back and the holes facing you at the front. And we pop it on top. Just wind this out till it's wide enough to fall over the top of the chain. Got that pin? Yep. So you pop the back one on and pull it this way towards you so it's in place. And you can feel, jiggle up and down, you can feel that that ridge is engaged on the two pins at the back nice and evenly. Then screw this one in with your fingers Until it just, all you want to do is snuck it up. There we are, that's it, that will stay there. 
bring that round out of the way. Just going to pop a socket on the end there and turn that handle. And you can feel it going on, but what's very important indeed is to keep taking it off and checking how far it's gone on. And I'll tell you at this point, it's very important that you don't squeeze this too much and then just wedge that too close onto the back pins and then it will be a, a solid link. You'll squeeze the O-rings and then it will be too far in. Some chains of sprockets you get, they have two little shims that fit on the inside and then that stops it going in too far, but this kit didn't come with that. So what I'm going to do instead is measure it at this point. Before I go any further, I'm going to do a couple more applications. Just, you want to do half a dozen, you know, don't be shy and think you can do it in one go. There we are. Back off again. Now, when I feel that with my finger, those pins are flush and they need to come through. So there's a little bit more to go yet. Before we do anything else, take a measurement. In the absence of the little shims that fit inside to gauge the width, I'm gonna use a caliper on this one. So we need it to be pressed in as much as this one up here. So I'm gonna measure that one up the top, coming on that, exact measurement, and that is 20.5 mil across. So coming in on the one we're squeezing, We're 22.2, so we've got about a mil and a half to go. So when they're flush, and you can feel it flush, you've got about a mil and a half, two mil to go. So keep going. Right, what I found is a quarter of a turn on the thread gives you about a quarter of a millimeter. So when that was right out, I've done a whole turn on the thread to press that in. And as you can see now, that's what sticks out. And coming in close, Ben. Mm -hmm. Let's take a measurement. 20.4. And I've got, where are we, 20.2. 20.2. So that's 0.2 of a millimeter further in, so as in it's closer together by 0.2 of a mil, and I think that's pretty accurate. To get that exact, I don't think you'd do it in this life. <laughs> right, now, the hardest thing, or let's say the thing that makes people the most nervous, this is the point where I used to hack it. I did it in a hack method in my old garage video on this, where you put a hammer head in behind, you put a punch on the front, and you hammer that punch in, but there's a far more calm and peaceful and ladylike way to do it, so let's show you how it's done. Okay, setting this up now to rivet the pin. Um, we use this one to push the old pin out. Don't need it this time. This is the other one. This has got a little dome on the end. Do you want to come in close, Ben, on that? Mm -hmm. I'll put a spring on it as well. Right, as you see on the end there, you see mm -hmm. it close? Mm -hmm. That's got a little dome on the end, like a little mm -hmm. a dimple. But if you look really close, really close, it's got a dimple surrounded by a flat area which is very important and I'll use a little diagram again just to show you how to do that. That drops in the back of the magazine again. You screw the press in on top of it until it pokes out the end and it doesn't want to poke out the end very much, probably five or six mil, that's absolutely fine. Now that, we then have a little anvil here, a little receiver which goes in that end. So that's now set up for riveting the pin but I want to show you what that looks like really super close up with the drawing and what that looks like, how we're going to do it. Okay, so we take the chain, the pin, we'll do one pin at a time. If we look at the pin, the pin looks like that if you blew it right up with a big camera. And this tool looks like that. And when that goes into there, what you end up with is an interface between the two, like that. So you can see as this dimple 
pushes inwards to this dimple, they're the wrong shape, they're slightly alternate. And as that presses here and here, it's gonna spread that out, that way and that way, like that. So what you end up with is this. One piece in the tool like that. So that's from there, that's where it touches, and that's what we want to end up with, with that touching each side. Now, this amount of flare here is extremely exaggerated for the drawing. It actually only flares out about two or three thousandths of an inch. It's tiny, just enough, because if you look at it, here is the chain link. So you're only flaring from there outwards very slightly it's not even a visible flare you won't see it but what you will notice is that when you put it up close we're going to try with the camera you'll see this gap where the two don't quite meet and there's this gap here and then you'll see as we press it in it comes in nice and close and it rests against the surface like that and you get a nice flat flare so let's get stuck in so again one pin at a time this is a little anvil with a recess in it and as you can see that fits on the back of the chain nice and located nice and solid it won't allow the back of that pin to move anywhere it won't press on the plates pushing them together it only presses on the pin it doesn't fit right over the pin you notice it moves around let me fit, fit one on the front if you notice there it doesn't fit over the pin and touch the surface of the plate it actually rests just on the pin alone meaning that when that's pressing on there and you're pressing on this end, only the pin is being forced against, not these two plates, which will then collapse them too far together, which we've just took all that trouble to set correctly. So that little anvil just locates on the back and allows that to put pressure on the front. So let's put it in place properly. Now on the back. Oops. I'm going to bring that because the the outer one supports the inner one. There we are. Now that's locked in. Now what I'm going to do is use the little T-bar because that doesn't give me much purchase because I don't want to press on it a lot. I'm just going to come in on that and do about half a turn. That's it. No more come off and do the other pin there it is, take the trouble to line it up little t-bar in and half a turn that's it that's all it needs now you can test it if I show you this take the pin out okay it's our first test I took a little cloth and cleaned them out. I'm now just taking the pin out. I'm just popping it in to feel that dimple has still got movement inside the other dimple. One should be flush up against the other. So the rounded section of this dimple needs to be fully inside the hole. But at the moment, there's still some of it outside. As you can see, there's still a gap there. So I need to do another half turn on them if I can and see if I can make that go all the way in. Okay, try again. And this time fits all the way in. So that pin, has, the, the dimple has gone all the way in and spread itself a hole big enough so that that surrounding collar is flush. So much so that it sits in the hole. So you can press on that harder now all you like and it won't do anything because you're not spreading it anymore. You've spread it as much as that dimple is designed to do and any more than that, press any harder, you're going to damage that pin and then break your tool. That is perfectly fine. No problems at all.
Right, there we go. Simple use of a chain splitter and riveter. Take it careful, they can be broken. There we go. And we also keep it all safe. So this, like I said, was 35 pounds. Um, it's a Sealy one. There are Chinese copies. I just want to make a point of this. You can spend silly money on these, you truly can. And that's normally, I call silly money like 500 quid. But then if you're a mechanic doing this all day long every day, you'd have no choice but to spend that kind of money on the tool. And you probably find your company would buy it for you anyway. But something like this for DIY use for your garage is absolutely fine. And again, quite surprised. Went to Sealy's own website, 72 pounds. Went to Wimoto's website, 35 pounds. Same item, so much better value. Yeah, right, now we're going to clean this up and paint the link. Master of the sun, memories full in finished this in the sense that I'm not going to show you adjusting the wheel because you know how to do that and I'm not going to finish buttoning all this up purely because we're replacing the disc on the other side of the wheel in probably the next video on this aren't we Pen? Mm -hmm. So we're going to do new discs and new pads in both ends of the bike. The discs simply haven't turned up yet otherwise I would have used the opportunity while the wheel was out to do it today. However, today I've just done that, that's chain sprockets, I wanted to show you the basic mechanical principles of changing the chain. The tip on getting the front off there with the brake or using the pin around the axle, you know that one, and how to rivet a chain. I'm quite... <laughs> Where's that link gone? There it is. Um, paint the tips of the link with something bright, even if it's tip X. Something that you can visually keep an eye on for the next few weeks while you ride the bike till that chain runs in and settles down. It is squeezed in enough, they are flared out enough, but you know how it is. There was a day when you mushroomed the end of those pins right over and you knew they weren't going anywhere. These, you really, you just flare them a little bit by a few thousandths of an inch and it just doesn't feel right. The sort of, our generation, you know, if you're as old as me, you'll know what I mean. Basically, I like to keep them so I can keep a visual eye on it. In the past, I've painted the whole link that it's Penny's bike and she only wants two little, what's Thoughts. that called? What's that called? Dragon's blood. Dragon's blood nail varnish. You can put it on there, it looks quite cool. And there we are. Now that chain, this gold finish is pretty uncorrodable. It's quite um, non-ferrous coating on them, so they are pretty good at staying as they are. This chain is not going to get covered in chain wax and grease and grime. It's going to stay nice and clean. We're going to use a dry PTFD lubricant on it, which will keep it lubricated, but it won't build anything up on it. So that's another thing we'll talk about another day. And there we are, chain sprockets, Triumph Scrambler, it could be Triumph Bonneville, Triumph anything, in fact this could be on a higher booster because what we've shown you today is just the basic principles of changing a chain sprockets. It really is easy, if you did it end to end, bash bash, knocked it out, it's two hours work at the most, it really isn't the end of the world and you pay anything from 100 quid for a chain sprocket set up to 200 quid depending on how posh you want to be. You can get coloured chains to match your bike which are a bit cool if you're into that sort of thing or like Penny wanted something gold to go with the black and gold on the bike. And there we are. Do you like that Is that okay? That's well can I, can I do mine now? Yeah. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Thanks for watching. I hope that's good for you. If you need any questions answered, if you need tips or guidance, just drop it in the comments box underneath and we'll do our best to answer you as quick as we can, won't we? We will. There we go, folks. Thanks for watching. Ride safe, take easy, and we'll see you next time. I swear rain doesn't fall on my field. It takes a drought to avoid all the secrets that I conceal. Hidden within the dust, cover land behind the city. The street lights are dim and the fog is always walking with me. It's nothing new, my eyes adjusted to the scene. Flickering on and off, it's just the daily routine. I grab a hold of time, forcing not to leave The weeds grow sporadic in my home is where I'm quarantined Thinking less, move the top to where the fuel rests Giving all I got to breathe life to the common sense Moving the top to where the fuel rests Giving all I got to breathe life to your silhouette, silhouette. Different plots intertwined and connected We pass in the street but all we notice are the vibes are reflected 
question is, do we take a deflect? It seems heavy. But when I rolled my hands with steady, the whites of his eyes seen from the paper till I was ready. Frustration became more common than being calm and outcast. Walked in the motion of every song till it fades. I washed away the shades of color, peeled back the winter, bringing light to my summer. I spent the longest time trying to decide on who to be. My destiny manifests, my mind's in the open sea.